Men are good as are you. Indeed. And today we're going to pick up on where we left off with fatherlessness. Engineered fatherlessness creates chaos. And indeed it does create chaos. And we're going to look today about what were the cultural pieces that started all this? And how does feminism play in with this? And oh, it's a doozy. So hang in there for good old part two. And we're going to start by going way back to the 1950s, because a lot of people today don't really have a good sense of what it was like to live in the 1950s. Well, let me tell you a couple of things. One, they had these things called Homes for Unwed Mothers. You see the one right back there. That's uh, the Richmond Home for Unwed Mothers. And they had these all over the place. In fact, when I was in high school, <laughs> I think probably also in, in middle school, the... Uh, all of a sudden, a girl would disappear. She wouldn't be coming to school anymore. And it's like you wouldn't notice it first. And then after a while, you go, what the hell's going on? And then you say, well, where's so-and-so? Oh, she... And the girls all knew because they gossiped a lot. But it turns out, you know, that she was pregnant. She got pregnant. And she got yanked out of school. And her parents took her to this home for unwed mothers, never to be seen again, at least in that school. And that's what was going on. And can you feel the shame that's there? There was this shame for having been an unwed mother. And the guy who got her pregnant, or knocked up, as we used to say, the guy that got her pregnant was usually responsible to go and marry her. You know, the parents of the pregnant girl would go to the parents of the, of the impregnating boy and say, your boy got our daughter pregnant and now we got to do something about it. And they, they all put their heads together and they usually what came up with was that he was going to marry her right then and there. They called that a shotgun wedding. But the importance of all this is can you feel the difference between then and now? The shame, the unwed mothers, the scurrying away, getting out of sight, you know, not, not letting other people know what's really going on. It's like there was a real shame-based peace around single mothers. It was like you were an unwed mother. That was a bad thing to be, you know? Oh, boy. So that's the 1950s and the early 60s, too. And then all of a sudden, we get to the 1960s. And all kinds of things break loose. So you come to the 1960s and just think about the contrast. Now we have Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> he was big. He was really big. And everybody loved Jimi. All the young people loved him. The old people thought he was crazy and they thought that we were crazy for loving him. But man, could he play. Holy crap. So you got this contrast between the unwed mother piece in the 50s and all of a sudden kaboom. You know, with Elvis kind of in between, you've got this thing coming online with Jimi Hendrix. Just, <laughs> and there were other things that came online too. You know, Woodstock was the late 60s, 1969, the summer of 69, I think. Think about it. Just so many young people gathering together to hear rock music. And they, the parents thought this was absolutely insane. Absolutely insane. And then, you know, we had Vietnam going on at the same time where there's this push from the government to force young men into being drafted because you didn't have a choice. You know, if your draft card said you were you were 1A, you were in trouble. You know, I had a 2S, I had a, a student deferment until I got out of college, but man, you know, we had to worry about that and I had to make sure I had good enough grades otherwise I would have been shipped to Vietnam. Like my other friends, some of whom died there. I mean, we were pissed. We were literally pissed off, and a lot of the young people got separated from the government. They said, uh uh, nah uh, we don't like this stuff with this government crap. You know, this is the something not right. We called it the establishment, right? There was us and them, and the establishment was what was doing these things. And uh, you can imagine how we didn't like that at all. And then along comes things called like abortion, right? Where suddenly, instead of being an unwed mother, you can go and get an abortion. Hmm, now that wasn't quite in the 60s. I think that started, you know, in the mid-70s. It's so earlier maybe a little bit, but uh, but that's part of the cultural shift that happened. in the moon thing in 1969, the same summer as Woodstock, you know, that landing on the moon, you can just get a sense of the contrast and the shock that the people were going through in the 60s. It's like, it's like 
didn't make sense, didn't add up. You know, this, this split between the young people and the older people. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And then we had, uh, oh, the pill. The pill came along. No more unwed mothers unless you forgot to take your pill. <laughs> so can you feel the difference in the two? A huge difference in the, the contrast between the 60s and the 50s. And then, you know, sadly, Martin Luther King was killed in the uh, 1968, I think. So all of this is being stirred together, this unrest, this, this dissatisfaction with the way things are, dissatisfaction with the, with the daggone establishment. And it was just a very, very difficult time. And it was a time when there was a lot of protests. You know, I was involved in anti-war protests and uh, civil rights protests, as were many of my peers. And that was just kind of what you did at the time, if you were a student. And then along comes feminism. Okay, so along comes feminism. That is, I guess, the first part of second wave feminism, they call it. Feminism comes along and after the sleepy 50s and the daggone slamming uh, 1960s, the late 60s, just crazy stuff happening. The world is kind of tumultuous and things are, are, are bubbling, you know, and the world is set because the young people and a lot of people saw the establishment as being a huge problem. And, you know, the whole Vietnam thing and, and uh, the civil rights thing and along comes feminism. And they took advantage of that and they started calling it patriarchy. Hmm, patriarchy. And we heard the word patriarchy, but we really didn't pay much attention to what they were talking about. But remember, a lot of these feminists in the late 60s were, were veterans of protests of both the uh, civil rights movement and the, uh, the anti-war movement, even though you know they were kind of a part of that. They'd never really um, protested for themselves, but they started. But anyway, let's back up just a little bit, because what... Was it that feminism wanted? You know, everyone thinks they wanted equality for women, which is such a wonderful thing that they would want equality for women. This is so important. But really, underneath it, what they wanted and what they wrote about that they wanted was they wanted to destroy the American family. Wait a minute. Destroy the American family. Why? Why on earth would they want to destroy the American family? Well, because they saw the American family as being a straitjacket for women. That they couldn't get out and be their real selves until they got rid of that American family. <laughs> and what do you have to get rid of in order to get rid of the American family? You've got to get rid of the fathers. You've got to get rid of the men. And this was very clear in their writing, although they didn't talk about it a whole lot on the media. You wouldn't see that published on the media. I can remember talking with my own family of origin and, and talking with my mother and sister one day and, and saying, you know, the real purpose of feminism is to destroy the American family. And they thought I was absolutely insane. I mean, I could have been saying that the earth was made out of broccoli or something. I mean, it was just they thought I was absolutely insane. And I realized at that point... People cannot take this in. It's too much to take in. And feminists were very sly not to mention that that's their real motive. But I want you to think about this. What kind of evil would it take to want to destroy healthy families? I mean, that's the only word I can think of is evil. That or stupid. And probably a combination of the two. You know, because really that is an evil thing to want to do to destroy families. And they did. Oh, they did. Fathers have been basically destroyed. You know, now we saw in the last, in part one, that 70% of black kids now are growing up without a father in the home. And I think it's 30% of white kids and, and uh, 45% of the Hispanic, I forget what it was. But a lot, a lot. They have killed our families by killing the fathers. So as far as I'm concerned, that's some evil stuff. But the feminists started out in the 60s. I'll never forget. <laughs> 1968, they protested, guess what? Miss America pageant. You know, they protested the Miss America pageant saying women shouldn't be treated like pieces of beef and, you know, this and that and the other. And, and uh, yeah, there's a certain point to that. Well, they had this um, trash can there. They had this trash can. They call it the Freedom Trash Can. And they'd throw panties and girdles and whatever's into the trash can, and they'd be 
done with it. You know, they're, they're, they'd show them. And, and uh, apparently one of the women burned a bra at one point, or maybe they didn't, but someone said that they did. And that became what the media latched onto. This is a bunch of bra-burning feminists. We laughed. I remember I was in high school at the time. I thought <laughs> we all thought it was funny. We thought it was crazy. You know, here we are protesting against getting killed in Vietnam and they're protesting about, you know, burning bras. It's like, are you kidding me? They were a laughing stock. They were an absolute laughing stock. And um, they didn't stay a laughing stock for too long. And, you know, oh boy, how did they do it? How did they stop from being a laughing stop? Because really, it was pretty ridiculous what they were saying. But the way they stopped was, they got money. And who'd they get money from? First, not the government. No, they got money from Ford, Rockefeller, and all kinds of foundations who would fill them with cash. Now think about that. And I'm talking a lot of money here. Someone estimated that it's uh, by 19 or by 2007, or I think that said that they had gotten five billion dollars. Five billion dollars. That's with a B. Imagine what we could do for men's issues if we just had a tiny fraction of that. But anyway, we'll be talking in a minute about the way they used the money. But one of the ways they did it was that they, um, when you have money, you can do a lot of things. They threw these big luncheons for um, media people, you know, the writers. They'd throw them these big luncheons and lavish luncheons where they, you know, of course, these people want to come in and have a free lunch, right? They come in and have a free lunch, but they have to hear the talk of the feminists gave. And they start making relationships with these people. And it's pretty smart. You know, they built up relationships with the media so that the media then starts slowly to tell their story, not the bra burning story. And <laughs> they've used that tactic over and over and over again. You know, in domestic violence, they've, geez, they've, They've used the money that they got from the government to do what? To give workshops to the police and to the judges and to the this and to the that. And what were they paid by the government to do? To convince people that their narrative, this hateful narrative about thinking the American family needed to go, was the thing that they needed to write about. You know, these fathers, they're just horrible people. Oh, boy. So, you know, they, they had these luncheons for the media. They had workshops. They did all kinds of things. And it became very, very effective. And they slowly changed the narrative around into being one of feminists for what? They were the victims. They were the victims and the fathers were the perpetrators. Well, I ran into this book by a guy named Frank Zeppesauer. And if you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. Frank wrote this book called The Feminist Crusades, Making Myths and Building Bureaucracies. And man, that sums it up very, very well. The book goes through chapter by chapter about the different crusades, whether it's domestic violence or women's health or sex assault or whatever. And he's got like 12, 15 chapters. And he tells exactly how they went through getting what they got. He talks about who gave them the money and how much, who the people were, who the foundations were that they built. You know, it's just an amazing book, amazing book. And at the end, he lists all of the feminist organizations and the amount of money that they've gotten uh, over the years. And it's just a mind boggling amount. I think by now, if Frank were still alive. I think he died in 2014 or so. If he were still alive, I think he would say that, you know, it's the tens of billions of dollars that they've been donated to. And you can do a lot with that kind of money. Well, Frank, I, I, you really should read Frank's book. But in the very introduction, listen to this. This is the start. He talks about Minogue. This article by Minogue, who is a, uh, uh, Minogue was a writer. He wrote this, this article called The uh, How Civilizations Fall or something close to that. But listen to this. Feminist radicals, Minogue continued, brought about this catastrophe by managing to impose on society a quasi-religious fundamentalism. Now that's about right. It rested on the false and eccentric assumption of male and female isomorphism. In other words, their male and female are the same. And sought to create a totally androgynous and manipulable world where men and women would become virtually indistinguishable at that point, men and women would, it was believed, be equally distributed at every level in every field of endeavor, both private and public. 
Man, that's the best little paragraph summation of what they've done um, that I've ever seen. And that's in this book written by Frank Zeppazauer. I'd highly recommend you reading it. And he goes on. There's a lot of other stuff. I wish I could read the whole book to you because it is fascinating stuff. But let's read this one little paragraph. Because the key to modern Western civilization is its openness to talent wherever found, the feminist demand for collective quotas has overturned the basic feature of our civilization. And this is, again, Frank is quoting from this Minogue article. But that's, that's exactly right. Before, we had a culture where the best were hired. You hire the best person to do the job, no matter who that was. You hire the best, and everyone wanted to work towards being that person who got chosen, work towards being the best, right? That built things very, very well. But that got turned on its head with the feminist idea of quotas. No, we have to have equal this and equal that. Absolutely insane stuff. Yeah, anyway, Frank goes into detail about how they went about doing this and the kinds of things the feminists would do um, to get their crusades to be successful crusades, right? And he quotes, um, what's her name? Um, Christina Hoff Summers. And she said, there's three things. Do a study, right? Then um, declare a crisis, and then work up the the, uh, the legislators until they have to give you money. And then Frank adds on a fourth. He says, build a bureaucracy. And oh, Lord, is that the truth. If you just look around today, there are so many female-drenched bureaucracies that are filled with women who probably have women's studies degrees, and they are running things. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So let's do the first one. Do a study, says Frank and says Christina. Yeah, that's what they do. They do this bogus study. And, you know, we're going to talk later about uh, Strauss and how Strauss did uh, an article, a journal article, peer-reviewed journal article, where he showed the seven ways that feminists lie in their research. (laughs) That's a doozy too. But the first thing they do is they do a study. They do a study and they craft that study just so it's going to be the words they need in order to create a crisis, right? Oh, yeah, do a study. And they make it look like, oh, this is scientific. This is this is a fact. This is this research says this. You know, that used to be that the Bible was the go-to. You know, 100 years ago, if it said in the Bible, then it must be true. And then slowly the 20th century came around and it said, no, no. If research says it's true, it must be true, right? And so the feminists knew this, so they do the study first. They create this study, right? (laughs) And then they use that study to do what? They use it to declare a crisis. And here's what they do. You see the men back there? (laughs) The men back there, there, wherever they are on that train. Yeah, they're going to run over this poor young lady. She's in crisis. Oh no, she's going to get run over. Can you feel what that does to people? Can you feel that? Ooh, I can feel it. It's called gynocentrism. They've used gynocentrism to declare a crisis and to get the legislative men all worked up, right? It's the men who are the problem. These men in this train have come down. Oh boy, look out. And she's going to get squished unless you do something. So the men, what do they do? Oh my gosh. They get politicians worked up, worked up and worked up. The politicians get worked up to such a degree that they start handing out money like candy. Oh boy. I think the VAWA was $1.8 billion that first year in 1994. $1.8 $1.8 billion. And, you know, we really can't blame the feminists for all this. We've got to blame the legislators and ourselves. Because, really, the problem was not the feminists ask for something. You should be able to ask for whatever you want. The problem was the legislators' complete incapacity to say no. No, no, and no. And to this day, we still have that problem. Because the legislators said, well... Maybe if I fund this women's stuff, maybe I'll get reelected. And if I don't fund it, sure as hell I won't get reelected. So 
They were in it for themselves, not for the good of the country. And Zeppesauer's book goes through these different ways that these different <laughs> different crusades have gone through and talked politicians into seeing there's a crisis and working them up and getting them to go out there and do something about it. That means give feminists more money. And the more money they got, the more lethal they became and the more hateful they became. You know, just hateful towards men, men as the problem, and convincing women at the same time that guess what? You're oppressed. You're victims. You don't have agency. Oh, God. <clears throat> because, you know, why don't our politicians not say no? Well, one of the reasons is that we know now from the moral typecasting research that women generally are seen as having patience. What does that mean? Patience means when you have patience, that means you're probably deserving of help. You're probably a victim of something or someone, and we need to help you right away, right? That's when someone has patience. And women are generally seen as having patience. Men are seen as having agency. That means you get things done. But unfortunately, it also means that people don't think you need help. And in fact, people think you should take the blame for whatever the problem is. And so, and this is gynocentrism. This is the essence of gynocentrism. And so they used this, they used this idea to force men into saying, yes, 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 we'll give you this, and not being able to say no. Oh, boy. And yet another reason that the men had a hard time saying no were due to feminist lies. Oh, man, you know, if it was just one thing that they lied about, they could almost tolerate it, or two, but it was over and over and over again. I mean, great googly moogly. Over and over again, feminist lies on feminist lies on feminist lies. Let's see how many of these you remember. I remember all of them. You know, I remember all of them. But let's let's see how many you can remember. Tell me in the comments below if I've left any out or if, which ones you remember. One in four women are raped. That was a slogan, a lie, right? The actual number was more like one in a thousand but one in four women are raped and they tell these politicians this. They show them the research that proves this is the case. And then, boom, what does the politician do? Oh, I can't go against that. If it's one in four women, geez, that means my next door neighbor has probably been raped. <laughs> you know, it's just like these lies are just so powerful. And, of course, you know, people don't find out that they're lies until well after the money comes rolling in. Oh, boy. Let's look at another one. 59 cents on a dollar. Oh, God. I mean, Warren Farrell debunked that a long time ago, but it still lives on. It's it's the the myth that keeps on living. You know, you can't kill it. It's 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 uh, indestructible. 59 cents on a dollar. I think they're up to 67 or something like that now. But women get paid less per blah, blah. But they, of course, you know, the lie is because they don't take into account all sorts of factors that are involved. And when you do take those factors into account, it goes down to what? Maybe two or three cents per dollar. And there's more than that. I mean, there are some cases where women actually are earning more than men. But who knows? Zero women in cardiac testing. Do you remember that one? Oh, I remember it. I remember thinking, damn, zero women in cardiac testing. Wow, how about that? Until I found out that, guess what? The reason that they wouldn't put women into testing stuff is to protect them. You know, we use animals for testing. Then we use men. And then later, women and, and children are last, right? Because we want to protect them the most. I mean, how many women were in the Tuskegee experiments? Ha, 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 zero. Why? Because we're protecting women. I mean, really, we're protecting them, and they turned that into oppression. That's pretty slick. Pretty slick. Nine in ten women suffered sexual harassment. Yeah, nine in ten. I mean, come on. That's just, uh, it's an exaggeration, but they've got research to prove it, and the politicians jump and pump more and more money into all of this nonsense. Oh, boy. Oh, 17. Minus 17. You guys remember that one? This was in the 90s. Minus 17 was the 17% drop in self-esteem that young girls got when they entered adolescence. Well, guess what? 
It was bogus. There was no such thing as a 70% drop. If you look at the research, it was crazy. But they tried to get this to have people focus on women or girls in schools. and uh, Girls need attention. They need this and that. Of course, at the time, boys were the ones who were having trouble in school, right? And always have been, at least in the reading and, and writing piece. And what did they do? Oh, girls drop in self-esteem. We've got to pay attention to this. If you don't, you're a real problem. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, me. Seven in ten fathers win custody. How many people remember that one? Oh, boy. Yeah, seven in ten fathers win custody. It's more like, what is it, like 80% of women now win custody? It's, it's more like eight in ten women. It's not seven in ten men. Great googly moogly. One in three women are sexually abused. Yeah, there's, you know, there's a good amount of women who are sexually abused, and men too. I think it's one in seven men are sexually abused. And that's the guesstimate. And it's, I think it's it's a, le- a little bit less than that for women. I think it's one in five. I forget. But it's not one in three. That's an exaggeration, just like all the other ones. Yeah. Did I forget one? No, I didn't forget that one. I didn't forget that one. <laughs> so there we go. Four in ten women are battered at home. That's the domestic violence piece. Forty percent of women are victims of domestic violence. Hmm. Now I'll give them that it's probably one percent or something like that. You know, one out of a hundred maybe. And it also depends on the way they ask the question because the research, and we'll see this in the in the next section we're going to do. The research basically says, have you ever had a man? get in an argument with you? And did he touch you when you had the argument? <laughs> and so they lump this, you know, touching you into the, you know, battered women. And it's just, you know, they take these things and they just make it as exaggerated as they can. Anyway, oh boy. 10,000 deaths in back alley abortions. That was the number of deaths per year in back alley abortions. And so of course you want to have abortion legalized so all of these women would stop being killed. Oh, boy. And then the probably the father of them all. Divorce gives men 42% plus in their wealth after a divorce. You know? And women goes down 73%. So they're, this lie is that divorce really helps men financially. The men come out on top of things. They get actually more wealth because they're divorced. And the women, no, they go down 73%. That's a huge huge lie as most of the guys listening to this know very well because man how many guys had to live in their cars after a divorce you know because the, the courts would just nail them it's just crazy but this kind of lie the the researcher or the uh, legislators see it they see the quote research and they're moved into not saying no how can i say no about something like that Oh, boy. So over and over and over again, you know, these legislators just said yes instead of no. And over and over and over again, the men in the United States let it go by. I'm one of them. We let it go by. We could have raised a ruckus. And we started raising a ruckus in the in the early 2000s, but it didn't make any difference by then. It just didn't make any difference. It was so ingrained into these, quote, um, what do you call them? Um, bureaucracies, you know bureaucracies and that's what we're going to talk about next and then they build a bureaucracy uh, the u.s department of women indeed and it feels like that's uh we got these all over the place i remember when i was the the vice chairman of the uh maryland commission for men's health you know it was a great thing it was a wonderful thing that maryland did that and by the way the guy the politician that that created that commission lost the very next election he was a very popular psychologist black man from uh, tacoma park and he got nixed and i think a part of it's because he got this creation of this commission for men's health well we we got the commission going i was the vice chair and and they dedicated two or three members of the health department to be our quote assistants and to come in and help us with research and this and that and the other but every time i'd call them up and ask them for help they wouldn't call me back. (laughs) And when they were in the meetings, I'd say, you know, we need your help with this and that. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. But they never lifted one finger. They didn't do a thing. And in fact, the the commission had four reports that came out. Four reports. Four reports. And daggone it, 
One of the reports got sent to the governor and to the legislature, as it was supposed to have done. But the four reports were all okayed by the commission. All, all said, yes, these are to be sent. And the health department never sent three of them. Hmm. The one they sent was the one done by the head of the commission. And it was kind of a milk toasty, men need to step up and, and quit smoking kind of thing. And uh, the three that I wrote, were they weren't bad, but they were calling out the health department for what they weren't doing and, and showing that almost all of the programs were for women. And there's very little programs for men. Well, I don't think they like that very much. And they kept me from publishing those. And so it took me a year to trace them down and to find out what happened to them and then to finally get them published. But it was too late by that point. Anyway, our bureaucracies are filled with, with women who have been taught this whole idea that there's something wrong with men. And men asking for something? Horrors. You know, <laughs> this is not what we want. This is not a good thing. Holy crap. The opposite of men are good, right? Okay, so let's sum things up here. We've said a lot. Let's, let's do a summary. First thing, do a study. Do a study. A book of study, but do a study. Next, declare a crisis. Oh, this is terrible. This is terrible. We've got to have help right away. Work up politicians. Make those politicians think that you need something really bad and shame them if they won't help you out. And then create a bureaucracy. Boy, we've seen those four just over and over again, haven't we? Yeah. So that's kind of the summary of the template of how they did things. But I think underneath that, there's a couple other things. One is a lie. They would lie and lie and lie. And we've talked about the different things they lied about. So lies first, then saying no to men. Saying no to men. I mean, think about it. We've gotten to the point now where women are saying no to men to such a degree that they had this Washington Post article that said, uh, why can't we hate men? Why can't we hate men? And, you know, we've moved from a point of father knows best into toxic masculinity, where the feminists and others have pushed this idea that masculinity itself is toxic and that men need to be more like women. This is a part of the feminist playbook. Lie, find ways to denigrate men, and use what? Use centrism. Linocentrism. <laughs> yeah, of course, gynocentrism, but I'd like linocentrism because it kind of sums up the different things they did. And why did they do that? They did it to destroy the family. Remember, Get rid of fathers. Get rid of the American family. The, the whole purpose behind this was to get rid of the family and destroy the family. And in doing so, what did they do? They've denigrated fathers and moved fathers out of the home and created chaos. Just absolute chaos. Absolute mess. And men have suffered tremendously because of this. But so have women. Think about it. I mean, men are now hated. So I'd call that a, a, a certainly a righteous suffering. Uh, but what happened to women? You know, throughout all of this feminist stuff, women have been brainwashed. The first thing we can think about right now is they're brainwashed to think that fatherhood is not really necessary. Hmm. Single mothers are plenty. Single mothers are enough. They can do everything. They're the heroes. Um, read the research. Read the research. That's bullshit. You know, it takes a father and a mother. It takes two parents. Two biological parents is best. Oh, well. Yeah. So that's one thing. Um, they think that motherhood can be rented out to minimum wage humans who don't love their children. Child care. Oh, yeah, we'll just send Junior out to child care so I can go be a manager at McDonald's. What? Those people don't love your children. They don't have the slightest urge to love them like you do. You're, you're basically minimizing your own importance, your own love for your kids by shipping them out someplace else. And women have been brainwashed, really, to think that men are the problem and women are oppressed. Oh, and that women need a job to be fulfilled. That's another one. And, of course, the last one is 
that they think they have a right to kill their babies. So all of those things are hurtful to women too. You know, feminism has been a real mess for both men and women. And that's enough for this part. We're going to talk, in part three, we're going to talk about domestic violence specifically and the different, how they did the study and used that to pull out slogans and lies, how they declared a crisis, they worked up politicians and created a bureaucracy. We're going to talk about all those things and show exactly how they did it. And we'll probably talk a little bit about the money involved too and how they did that. So until then, um, keep in mind, men are good, as are you. Yeah, and come see me on Patreon. You know, we're building, uh, rebuilding the Patreon site back up, and we've got a, a group of men there who meet every Sunday on Zoom, and we have a good time. Come on and join us, and we'll see you then. Men are good.